Chapter Nine of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baron Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Nine: Convalescence. The voice of Pasco was heard shouting up the stairs to his wife. Mrs. Pepperell, glad to escape the lecture, went to the door and called down, "Don't make such a noise when the girl is ill." Come, will you, Zara? There's someone wants to have a say with you. With a curt excuse to the parson, Mrs. Pepperell descended. She found her husband at the foot of the stairs, with his hand on the banister. Pasco, said she, what do you think now? The parson has been accusing me of murdering Kate. If she dies, if she dies, he says he'll have me up to the Exeter Assizes and hung for it. I'll never set foot in church again. Never. I'll join the primitive Methodists. As you please, said her husband. But go to the door at once. There is John Pook waiting, and won't be satisfied till he has had a talk with you about Kate. He wants to know all about Kitty, how she's doing, whether she's in danger, if she wants anything that the Pooks can supply. He's hanging about the door like what they call a morbid fly. He's in a terrible taking, and won't be put off with what I can tell. Well, now, exclaimed Zara, here's an idea. Something may come of that night on a mud-bank after all, and more than she deserves. Oh, my, if my Wilmot were alive, and Jan Pook were to inquire after her. Go up, Pasco, and send that parson away. I won't speak to him again, abusing of me and calling me names shameful, and he an ordained minister. What in the world are we coming to? When the doctor arrived, he pronounced that he would pull Kate through. Presently the delirium passed away, and on the following morning the light of intelligence returned to her eyes. "'They are still there,' she said eagerly, raising her head and listening. "'What are still there?' asked her aunt. "'The gulls.' In fact, these animated foam-flakes of the ocean were about in vast numbers, uttering their peculiar cries as they hovered over the mud. "'Of course they are there. Why not?' Father said he was going to make ladies' waistcoats of them, and I had been fretting and crying. And then, the daffodils. Oh, bother the daffodils and the gulls. They may wait a long while before waistcoats are made of them. It's not of daffodils Father was going to make waistcoats. He said he would have all the gulls shot. Never were at your head about that. The birds can take care of themselves and fly away to sea. But the daffodils cannot get away. He was going to have a sigh, and mow them all down and sell them. Wait till folk are fools enough to buy. There was much to be done in the house. Mrs. Pepperell was unable to always be in the room with her niece. It was too early in the year for pleasure parties to come up the river in boats for tea or coffee, winkles and cockles, in the open air, but the house itself exacted attention. The cooking, the washing, had to be done. Now that Zara was deprived of the assistance of her niece— Perhaps for the first time did she realize how useful the girl had been to her. By night Kate was left alone. There was no space in the attic chamber for a second bed, nor did her condition require imperatively that someone should be with her all night. When her consciousness returned, Kate woke in the long darkness, and watched the circular spots of light that danced on the walls and careened over the floor, as the rushlight flickered in the draught between the window and the door. Above, on the low ceiling was the circle of light. Broad and yellow as the moon, cast by the candle, its rays unimpeded in that direction, but all around was the perforated rim, and through that the rays shot and painted stars, stars at times moving, wheeling, glinting, and Kate, in a half-torpid condition, thought she could make out among them the plough with its curved tail, and wondered whether it were turning. Then she passed into dreamland, and woke and saw in the spots of light the white pearls of her uncle's neckcloth, and was puzzled why they did not remain stationary. Whilst vexing her mind with this question, she slid away into unconsciousness again, and when next her eyes opened, it was to see an orchard surrounding her, in which were daffodils that flickered, and she marveled that the great one was above on the ceiling, so much larger than the rest. Always, 
whenever with the ebb the gulls came up the river in thousands and their laugh rang into the little room it was to kate as though a waft of sea air blew over her hot face and she laughed also and said to herself they are not yet made into waistcoats occasionally she heard under her window a whistle piping there was a frog lived in a well and she once asked her aunt if that were father and why he did not come upstairs to see her your father is on dartmoor answered sarah then with a twinkle in her eye she added i reckon it is jan pook he has taken on terribly about you he comes every day to inquire whenever mrs pepperell had a little spare time she clambered up the steep staircase to see that her niece lacked nothing to give her food to make her take medicine to shake up her bed and every time that she thus mounted she muttered so i am killing her with cruelty the only suitable quarters for me is the exeter jail the proper end for me is the gallows i have put her into one of the atmospheric engine towers and have pumped the life out of her and yet i am blessed if i do not run off my legs going up and down these stairs if i ain't a ministering angel to her if she doesn't cost me pounds in doctor's bills i don't begrudge it but i'm a murderess all the same certain persons are mentally incapable of understanding a simile a good many are morally unwilling to apply one to themselves whether when it was spoken mrs pepperell comprehended or not the bearing of the rector's simile relative to the exhausting engine in the sequel she came to entirely misconceive it and to distort it into something quite different from what the speaker intended that was easily effected she was quite aware that much that the parson had said was true her conscience tingled under his gentle reproof but no sooner was that unfortunate simile uttered than her opportunity came for evading the cogency of his reproach and for working herself up into resentment against him for having charged her falsely that is one of the dangers that lurk in the employment of hyperbole and one of the advantages hyperbole gives to those addressed in reprimand with it zara had sufficient readiness of wit to seize on the opportunity and use her occasion against the speaker and in self-vindication the rector had not said that zara was depriving her niece of vital air that mattered not he had said that she was depriving her of what was as essential to life as vital air it is my own blessed self that i am killing said mrs pepperell running up these stairs ten hundred times in the day my heart jumping furiously and pumping all the vital air out of my lungs i'm sure i can't breathe when i get up into kate's room and he don't call that love he ought to be unfrocked by the bishop she came into the girl's chamber red in the face and puffing and went direct to her there now i'm bothered if something does not come of it to your advantage and mine kate but i'm tired of having to care about you jan pook has been here again that's the second time to-day of course asking after you there's no one in the family but jan and his sister and she is about to be married the pooks have a fine farm and money in the bank if you manage matters well you'll cut out that conceited minx rose who has marked him down come you are precious she stooped to kiss kate but the girl suddenly turned her face with a flaming cheek to the wall zara tossed her head and said to herself love she won't love i was about to kiss her and she would not have it then she got her needlework and seated herself at the window kate turned round at once to look at her she had shrunk from her aunt involuntarily not from the kiss but from her words which wounded her a strange child kate was if not asking questions with her lips she was seeking solutions to problems with her eyes she had fixed her great solemn orbs on her aunt and they remained on her not withdrawn for a moment till zara pepperell became uneasy fidgeted in her seat and said sharply am i a murderess or an atmospheric pump that you stare at me can't you find something else to look at kate made no reply but averted her face ten minutes later nevertheless zara felt again that the eyes were on her studying her features her expression noting everything about her seeming to probe her mind and search out every thought that passed in her head really 
If this is going on, I cannot stay, she said, rose and folded up the sheet she was hemming. There's such a thing as manners. I hate to be looked at. It is as if slugs were crawling over me. As Zara descended, she muttered, The girl is certainly born without a heart. I would have kissed her, but that she turned from me. I wish the parson had seen that. The weather changed. The edge was taken off the east wind. The sun had gained power. The rooks were in excitement repairing their nests and wasting sticks about the ground under the trees, making a mess and disorder of untidiness. The laborers begged for a day from their masters that they might set their potatoes. After work hours on the farms, they were busy in their gardens. In spring the sap of health rises in young arteries as in plants, and Kate recovered, not perhaps rapidly, but nevertheless steadily. She continued to be pale, with eyes preternaturally large. She was able to leave her chamber, and after a day or two assist in light housework. End of chapter 9